back. Today we're going to be reading In the Boy Who Dared by Susan Campbell Bartoletti. We're starting today on page 74. Another Christmas, another New Year, 1939. An uneasy peace falls across Europe. That spring, Germany annexes Czechoslovakia and then demands Danzig and the Polish Corridor, the land separating Germany from East Prussia. Britain and France send a stern warning to Hitler, promising to support Poland if Germany threatens to invade. An uneasy peace settles over the Sassenstrasse flat. 2. Unable to tolerate Hugo any longer, Gerhard moves out, taking over the small bedroom in Oma and Opa's flat. Helmuth misses Gerhard, and he falls into a routine designed to avoid Hugo. Morning at school. Noon meal with Oma and Opa. Evening study in his bedroom. There, Helmuth also eats supper, as he does his homework. At school, he takes typing and stenography classes. He prefers to practice in quiet, where Hugo won't make fun. If Muddy minds that Helmuth eats alone, she doesn't say. More and more these days, silence is how they get on. Now 14, Helmuth graduates into the Hitler Youth proper, though he skips the meetings as often as he dares. The Hitler Youth isn't as fun as the young folk. The older boys take everything much more seriously. The drilling, the weapons training, the endless military parades. He despises their politics, too. The way they power over one another, the way might equals right. Their games are brutal, as if they enjoy shedding blood on the field, pummeling the weaker ones. And if you don't follow along, the Hitler Youth leaders threaten you with extra drills and fines and weekend detention. Gerhard turns 18, and one night he and Helmuth walk down Suderstrasse, past what used to be Herr Seligman's butcher shop and Herr Kaltenbach's bake shop. The shops now bear Aryan names and swastika banners. I got my letter to appear before the military induction board, Gerhard tells Helmuth. The news stuns Helmuth. You're being drafted, but you have school. Gerhard shakes his head. They granted me a def deferment until I graduate, but I must still serve six months in the Reich Labor Service. What about Hans? asks Helmuth. He won't be drafted, says Gerhard. He already serves the fatherland by building submarines. The two brothers walk on in silence. All sorts of bitter feelings rise in Helmuth until finally he says, Hitler promises peace, but every day he moves us closer to war. I feel it too, says Gerhard. There doesn't seem to be anything we can do to stop the arrogance and hate and spite that leads to war. Helmuth looks at the swastika banners fluttering over the shops. The flags seem to gloat, seem to goose-step triumphantly down the street. By summer's end, the newspaper headlines scream about atrocities that Poles are committing against ethnic Germans. Hitler sends troops to the Polish border. War clouds gather and erupt. On September 1st, Helmuth bursts into his grandparents' flat and snaps on the radio. Gerhard, did you hear? The Poles have attacked us. They fired shots at our soldiers, and now we're firing back. We're at war. They listen in stunned silence. Hitler has declared war on Poland, and even now, as the RRG broadcasts the news, the Luftwaffe is bombing Poland by air, supported by tanks and infantry. The Reich has also passed a new law, the Extraordinary Radio Law, intended to protect the fatherland from lies and other enemy propaganda. Gerhard turns up the volume. Listen to the foreign Listening to foreign radio stations is forbidden, continues the newscaster. Violations will be punished by imprisonment or by death. Helmuth is infuriated by this latest restriction. How can the Nazis do this? He asks. How can we trust that they will tell us the truth? I love Germany, but this makes me hate it. Helmuth, says Gerhard, don't say such a thing. It's still our country, no matter who leads us. We must obey the law. I hate the thought of war, too, but we must defend the fatherland, no matter what. Helmuth snaps off the radio. The world has turned upside down, and yet it feels as though Hitler has been preparing for this moment for a very long time. Three days later, the world spins wildly again when the British and the French honor their promise to Poland and declare war on Germany. British planes fly over Germany, littering cities with leaflets. Helmuth picks one up. It is a warning to the German people. Your rulers have condemned you to the massacres, miseries, and privations of a war they can never hope to win, the leaflet says. He stares at the sheet. The Nazis call these leaflets enemy propaganda, designed to undermine German morale. 
By law, Helmuth is supposed to destroy the leaflet, but he doesn't, not right away. How can he be expected to obey a law that feels so wrong, to obey a leader who strips away one freedom after another? The Germans continue to strike Poland hard and fast in a new kind of warfare called a Blitzkrieg, a lightning-fast war. Throughout September, the Germans bomb cities and villages, leveling homes and buildings. There are whispers about terrible things happening in Poland, about low-flying planes that shoot women and children, about German soldiers who machine-gun Poles and Jews over mass graves. It sounds too terrible to believe. At home, Muddy drops another kind of bomb. She and Hugo are getting married. And they do on a Tuesday late in September. After the short ceremony, they gather at Oma and Opa's flat. Helmuth is about to take a bite of wedding cake when Hugo says to him, Wait and see, my boy. The war will be over as soon as this matter is settled with Poland. With his fingers, he shoves cake into his mouth. It's one thing to attack a weak Poland, says Gerhard, and quite another to take on England, the greatest power in Europe. Enough defeatist talk, says Hugo. We have to fight back. We can't let the Poles abuse Germans living in Poland. What about the Nazis' atrocities? asks Helmuth. He knows he's inviting an argument and that he shouldn't, not on Muddy's wedding day, but he can't help himself. The Nazis don't even try to hide what they do here to the Jews or to anyone who disagrees with them. Jews are not Germans, says Hugo, his temper flaring. They are foreigners. Germany is for Germans. As for the others, we can't tolerate defeatists. They should be arrested. We must have a united front during war. But not at the cost of our own freedom, says Helmuth. Just when you think you can't lose any more freedoms, the Nazis find another thing to take away. Now it's against the law to listen to foreign radio. Such laws are necessary during wartime, says Hugo brusquely. To protect the fatherland, the enemy will stop at nothing to destroy our will to victory. Their propaganda caused us to lose the great war. He fixes a stern eye on Helmuth. What's happened to you, Helmuth? You had better watch your step or you could find yourself sitting in jail. Or worse. Helmuth feels his blood turn icy. Hugo has never called him Helmuth before. He has always called him my boy. Has he pushed Hugo too far? Has he made a mistake in revealing his true thoughts to Hugo, the rotten furrer? Would Hugo the good Nazi denounce Helmuth for his beliefs? Helmuth grows sullen and distant, unable to bring himself to eat the cake as Hugo makes small talk with Opa. Muddy nudges Helmuth and hands him a cup of tea. A wilted mint leaf floated on top. Hugo is not a bad person, she whispered gently. But Muddy, he is wrong. Muddy smooths Helmuth's hair into place and touches his cheek. She looks hurt. Hugo stands and leads to the door. He nods to Muddy, his eyes warm. Let's go, he says, crooking his arm. Without another word, Helmuth, uh, without another word to Helmuth, Muddy straightens her skirts, links her arm with Hugo's, and leaves. Helmuth looks away as the darkness spreads inside him. His mother no longer belongs to him. Muddy belongs to Hugo. In late September, Warsaw falls. Poland surrenders, and trains filled with victorious German troops receive a jubilant homecoming. What did I say, exults Hugo, clapping his hands. The war would be over as soon as this matter with Poland is settled, and now, thanks to our fur, it is. Within days, however, more German soldiers are shipped on trains to the west. Throughout the fall and into the winter, all of Germany holds its breath, waits for more fighting, but nothing happens. See, says Hugo, Hitler is satisfied, just as he said he would be now that he has Poland. Hugo is wrong. The spring of 1940 sends German troops marching across France. Hamburg finds itself digging the thawing ground, tearing up city parks and building tall concrete towers armed with flak guns to shoot down enemy bombers. They also dig underground bomb shelters that can hold as many as 1,000 people. One June night, British bombers wing their way across the open water of the North Sea and grope their way up the Elbe, easily spotting Hamburg with its maze of waterways, docks, wharves, and oil refineries. The damage is light, mostly confined to the U-boat pens and refineries, but two errant bombs land in St. Pauli, a neighborhood known for its theaters and cafes and concert halls. The first bomb hits the middle of the street, upturning the pavement and leaving a gaping hole. The second strikes a tenement, blowing away the top floors. 
The next day, Helmuth and Rudy go see the damage for themselves, and it's shocking. Refuse lies everywhere. Piles of tumbled brick, shattered floors and walls, splintered furniture, broken glass. Everywhere, people with shovels and pails try to clean up the mess. This is Hitler's fault, Helmuth tells Rudy. He should have been satisfied with Poland the way he said he would. But no, instead he expands the war and goes into France. It's revenge, says Rudy. Says Rudy. Hitler's getting even for the Treaty of Versailles. Germany will be humiliated no more. Five days later, a newscaster shrills that Paris has fallen to the Germans, and the German people are overjoyed to see the Nazi flag hoisted over France. Thousands of French prisoners of war are shipped to Germany for forced labor in the German countryside, and Hitler sends the Luftwaffe to bomb Britain. By summer's end, Gerhard leaves for mandatory Reich labor service, where he is stationed outside Paris, France. It isn't so bad, Gerhard assures Helmuth in letters. I am assigned to headquarters, completing paperwork. The Technicum has agreed to give me credit, so I will graduate on time. The way the war is going, who knows? I may be home sooner than we all think. Muddy does not object when Helmuth takes over Gerhard's empty bedroom at his grandparents' flat, and soon Han joins him. Helmuth begins working as church secretary, a volunteer position. At night, behind shuttered windows, he sits at Oma's table. He types letters on the church's Remington typewriter for fellow Mormons stationed at the front. Each keystroke, each carriage return makes Helmuth hate Hitler and his war all the more. On September night, Helmuth, Carl, and Rudy are walking home. One September night, Helmuth, Carl, and Rudy are walking home together from choir practice. It is growing dark, but it is not curfew yet. Helmuth begins to sing, You Are My Sunshine, in a loud voice. It's an American song, one that the boys learned from church missionaries. The boys miss the American missionaries who were called home when war broke out. Come on, Helmuth urges Carl and Rudy. Sing, you know the words. Rudy is quiet. His English isn't very good. Carl's English isn't good either, but that doesn't stop him. He has always loved to sing, and so he joins Helmuth in a clear voice. Suddenly, Helmuth hears the distinct sound of marching boots. Carl stops singing, but Helmuth keeps on, even more loudly, as a Hitler Youth Patrol rounds the corner. He's egging on the Hitler Youth, and he knows it. Heil Hitler, says the patrol leader, saluting. Helmuth finishes the song quickly in one breath and snaps off a smart salute. Heil Hitler. He doesn't know these boys, but he recognizes their uniforms. H.J. Striden Feist, Patrol Force, Junior Gestapo. We need to see your identification cards, says the patrol leader. The boy is Helmuth's age, with a long, lean face, sleek as a greyhound's. Why? says Helmuth. It's not curfew yet. Rudy has his wallet out already. His identification card extracted. Come on, he says, nudging Helmuth. Show him your card. It's no big deal. But to Helmuth, it is a big deal. In anger, he snaps his card out of his wallet. The leader inspects it, writes down Helmuth's name and address, hands the card back. Good dot, why are you singing English songs, says the leader with an air of superiority. It's not English, says Helmuth. It's American. And why shouldn't we sing it? We're not fighting Americans. It's un-German, says the patrol leader. You should sing German songs. You'd better watch your step or you'll find yourself in weekend detention and possibly even a fine. Rudy grabs Helmuth's arm. Come on, he says. Let's go home. Helmuth is seething. He throws off Rudy's hand, struggles to get himself under control. He can't afford a fine, but he wants to tell, he wants to tell this patrol leader off. Carl intercedes. No need to get upset, he says to Helmuth. And then to the patrol leader, Carl adds, we were just having a little fun. We'll, we'll be careful and make sure our friend gets home. Get your friend home now, orders the patrol leader. I'm noting this incident on my report. The patrol force squad continues down the street, and in perfect rhythm, they pivot around the corner. Helmuth glares after them. The Hitler youth talk about comradeship, but what they really want to do is bully, he says, seething. Rudy nudges Helmuth. There are lots of things worth getting in trouble for, but not a song. Come on, let's go home. Forget about them.